Zakharov. I am the local action coordinator for Sustainable Food Places, uh, and I'm based at Sustain. Uh, and I'm joined here by uh, our wonderful colleagues um, at Sustain and um, Sustainable, the, and the other organizations involved in Sustainable Food Places. Um, I have my colleague, uh, Sophia Parente, who will be doing um, some of the background tech uh, and support, and also uh, my colleague, Ren, uh, who's also based at Sustain, uh, who will be um, helping out with links with the chat and other things, um, and other colleagues. Um, uh, we have Sarah Davies from Food Matters, who also works on Sustainable Food Places, and Elisa Graham-Brown, uh, based at um, Soil Association, who also works on Sustainable Food Places, and a few other wonderful colleagues at Sustain. And of course, we also have... <laughs> Also, we have our um, wonderful colleague, Shola Oladipo, who is joining us as uh, today's speaker, um, and I will introduce her in a moment. Uh, but just to say, um, uh, welcome. Please do introduce yourselves uh, in the chat box. I did it last night. And um, just also to say, um, this session is being recorded, uh, so hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, and if you prefer, you can keep your video off. Um, so this is Campaigns Breakfast. Normally, Campaigns Breakfast is um, uh, open to uh, campaign coordinators and leads within sustainable food places. Uh, but because today's session focusing on diversity, inclusion, and healthy eating campaigns uh, and programs just felt like it's such a, uh, an important and timely subject. So we decided to open it up more broadly uh, to the wider network, including um, our Sugar Smart Network. So welcome. Um, but uh, just to give a quick introduction uh, about the Sugar Smart campaign. So myself, I coordinate uh, the Sugar Smart campaign and my colleague Ren works on the campaign with me. And we're a, a nationwide network of local sugar reduction campaigns. Uh, we have over uh, it's, it's probably 69, 70 places that are involved in um, coordinating uh, uh, cross, a cross-sectoral approach to reducing sugar and increasing healthy eating within their local areas. Um, and we have, um, uh, it's really, it's open to both, um, uh, both food partnerships and local authorities who typically lead on the campaigns, as well as um, um, uh, participants across different sectors, uh, including uh, community groups, uh, local authorities, uh, businesses, uh, schools, uh, leisure settings, libraries, you name it, any place where people might um, be receiving healthy eating information or indeed be accessing food. So uh, this is just um, a, a quick introduction to Sugar Smart. Um, so if you are doing this kind of work locally or you are looking to uh, coordinate a cross-sectoral approach in your local area, uh, please do um, get involved uh, and you can register on the Sugar Smart website. So that's a quick plug. Um, and uh, I will pass on to Elisa Graham Brown to quickly introduce Sustainable Food Places as well. Thanks, Vera. Uh, morning, everyone. Hope you're all looking after yourselves and your mental health this morning um, and this week with lockdown coming. So, uh, yeah, let's prioritize ourselves uh, this week. Um, yeah, what is SFP? Sustainable Food Places, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a movement of food partnerships all across the UK. Um, food partnerships come in different forms um, and are hosted in different types of places. So cities, boroughs, counties, uh, you name it. Um, the program is led by three organizations, Soil Association, Sustain and Food Matters. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about what we do, do check out our website at sustainablefoodplaces.org. Uh, we have all kinds of regular events and campaigns, including Sugar Smart, Veg Cities, Fish Cities, um, that you can uh, get involved with. So do check us out. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, so uh, uh, without further ado, I will introduce um, Shola and um, pass on uh, the space to her to do her presentation. So um, Shola Oladipo is a registered dietitian and CEO of Food for Purpose, which is a not-for-profit organization that delivers practical solutions for eating, living, and functioning. Uh, Shola has uh, a keen interest in faith and health of uh, Black and minority ethnic communities um, uh, and has led to um, beneficial collaboration uh, with churches, NHS trusts, and local, council, uh, local councils. And this includes the development of the award-winning Healthy Church Initiative, uh, a culturally relevant church-based program for Black, African, 
and Caribbean churches. Um, this work has attracted a number of stakeholders, awards, grants, and more recently, uh, Shola has been a spokesperson for Public Health England's Change for Life campaign. Uh, she has also received recognition at Buckingham Palace from the Queen of England uh, and is currently doing a doctoral research um, um, a PhD at uh, Coventry University. Um, so, uh, and also just to add, um, she has recently recently joined Sugar Smart as our community's ambassador. Uh, but to add to that, she's been involved in the Sugar Smart campaign locally for a number of years. So we're so so pleased um, to have Shola here to um, uh, to share her experience and expertise uh, in this um, in this area of work. So thanks, Shola. I can take the stage. Thank you very much, Vera, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to be speaking this morning. Um, I'm going to share some slides. I'll share my screen, and um, this is the point where I also apologise um, because I am a self-confessed technophobe, and I'm a right-handed person, left-handed person living in a right-handed body. <clears throat> and I'm using a computer that I'm not used to. So if the slides go a bit gobbledygook, that's because I'm trying to assimilate everything. So welcome, welcome. I've titled our presentation this morning as Hard to Reach, as a, posing a question. And um, really, I am hoping to bring some insight into the um, a culturally relevant health intervention within the BAME community. Vera has kindly um, given a little bit of insight into that. Um, so this is me. Um, I've been a registered dietitian now for uh, 24 years, started my career at the Wealthy Hospital and spent a little bit of time doing nutrition support, so um, oncology, cancer, uh, HIV, and then moved into community dietetics. And I think that's really where I cut my teeth and found that working in the hospital and interacting with patients and carers is very, very different to the community and really felt that the community was the place to be in terms of sort of long-term um, healthcare programs and um, you know helping people to um, live normal more lives, so to speak. Um, I'm also a church leader. I'm married to a church leader. We're Pentecostal, what you'd call Pentecostals. Um, so imagine a lot of our communities around churches. We pastor a church in southeast London um, in the borough of Greenwich and um, my PhD is actually around um, church-based health programs which are massive in the US um, and sort of not um, as well understood in the UK, but hopefully today it'll give you a little bit of insight. And I'm also pr very proud to be a Sugar Smart ambassador. I left the NHS um, about four years ago to start Food for Purpose. And um, just really start with, with this slide. And, you know, I think what I'd like to draw your attention to is the empty chair. And I'm going to be quoting from a, a rather old reference. Um, you know, it's about 10 years old as a researcher it's kind of you know quite an old reference but I, and that's quite deliberate so in 2010 Flanagan and Hanok um, presented a qualitative piece which um, was some one-to-one -one interviews with um, vo the voluntary care sector and they were talking about their role in supporting people who were hard to reach and in their um, presentation of their, of their results in their study, they described people who are hard to reach as vulnerable, um, transient, marginalized, refusers, hidden, forgotten populations, special populations, and disadvantaged. And I am often approached by um, Public Health England, people who want um, to have additional insight into hard to reach communities. And one of the first things I'm always questioning is, are we really, or are they really, the people that you describe, are they really hard to reach? And it's quite interesting in 2010 that Flanagan and Hanok um, considered, you know, this group of people that were hard to reach. And, and the, the um, participants that they were referring to were people who were um, from black, Asian minority, ethnic communities. 
So let's talk about the black community, which in that bubble of hard to reach has sort of fallen in that um, rather unfortunate, you know, way of describing um, a group. Um, but black people do fall into that group. And I kind of get it, you know, let's be honest. I kind of understand why that may be. So black people um, are more likely, um, there's a lot of research to show that black people are more likely to be living with obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, some cancers, and now obviously COVID-19. And, um, you know, as an insider, so I live in Southeast London, Food for Purpose is a, is a micro organization in Southeast London, it runs from my home. And as an insider, when we look at Southeast London in particular, we note that they have very large numbers of black people. In fact, um, if you look at ONS data, in 2005, there was a 50% increase in the number of black African and Caribbean people moving into the London Borough of Southwark. But what I find more interesting is that um, the cohort of black African, as opposed to black Caribbean, um, was the was and is still the fastest growing ethnic group in the um, in London and in the UK. And at this point, this 50% increase was also synonymous with a 50% increase of black African churches in the borough of Southeast London. And um, Andrew Rogers, who is a reader at Roehampton University, described um, Southwark, London Borough of Southwark as the Pentecostal capital of Western Europe. Basically outside of Africa, it has, some of the, large, the, the largest number of black churches um, outside of Africa. Really, really interesting. What's the connection? The connection is, as an insider, um, that a lot of black people go to church. And remember, we're talking about a group that is supposedly hard to reach, but we see immediately an opportunity to reach perhaps a hard to reach group because they are frequenting a particular place. And in this study, going back to um, the study by Hanok, um, they also noted that voluntary groups or VCS, voluntary community sector, actually is better at reaching the so-called hard to reach. So small insider groups are better at reaching so-called hard to reach groups. I'm trying to build a thread, so do stay with me. So in the black church, still going inside a bit deeper with my dietitian's hat on, but also my church leader's hat on, the response to ill health in the black church may often provoke prayer. No, I lied. It often always provokes prayer. I understand um, as a woman of faith, as a church leader, why people put their faith foot forward first. So imagine someone getting a, a diagnosis of type two diabetes and a dollop of hypertension for good measure. Often people will go to the faith route first. Um, and, and that's be because often people are, are fearful and often mistrusting of the, often the diagnosis, often the cause. So people often feel that they were fine before they came to the shores of the UK or they were fine before they came to the doctors. Um, often there's fear and mistrust because people have either heard of somebody else's um, horrible health journey or health experience or often mistrust in terms of, you know, is this really real or is this something against me? Um, and often that people are in denial and feel, you know, when I was in Africa, when I was in the Caribbean, I was fine. I've been going to church. I've been fine. Um, you know, I read my scriptures. I'm fine. And often people have, you know, mixed priorities. They can't actually afford to stop and be ill. And, you know, being ill is quite a negative thing culturally, particularly being ill in a country that's not your home. So being ill away from home is quite negative. People have mixed priorities. Um, they're often working and supporting a home here in the UK and also supporting an extended family back home. So they can't afford to be ill. And therefore let's pray about it because prayer might just cover it. Obviously I know as a healthcare professional that you know faith is important, but without dealing with the other side, without working on it, people can become quite unwell. And this was something that I noticed um, as a church leader and as a healthcare professional. There's a lot of research that also shows that within the black church, black church leaders are quite influential, um, possibly more influential than the government 
and uh, definitely more influential than some medics, some GPs. Typically, I would have um, church members come to me and explain in very hushed voices that they've received a diagnosis of hypertension and they would come for prayer because um, or, uh, they, they want you to, to, you know, to help them to, to manage it via, via prayer. And in situations where um, church leaders may feel, you know, that the cause of illness is perhaps more spiritual um, and less about taking medication and changing the lifestyle, people can often be led down a road, which sometimes can be a little bit um, dangerous for them. The Black Church is also quite, you know, probably one of the most stable entities across Black history. Um, in terms of positionality, it's a place that people frequent often more than once a week. So you'd have a main sort of Sunday or Saturday service in terms of the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, but then you, what you have is people coming to a place and you can have sometimes four to five generations in one place at one time. Now, for me, that doesn't actually look like hard to reach. It looks like this is where people are catch them where they are. And again, there's a lot of research emerging more, more so from the US um, around faith-based health programs and a, there being a feasible way of addressing health in BAME groups. So based, with, based on that information, myself and my team carried out a, um, what we call some nutrition roadshows back in 2018. And we were really curious about, you know, what do people think about health at the pulpit? So we um, interviewed and invited 50 um, black church leaders across Southeast London, sorry, South London, um, to roadshows. And we asked them some questions. We put them in groups and asked them about their thoughts around about health at the pulpit, health in the black church. And 80% of them out of this 50 agreed that health was something that should be at the pulpit, which is quite, which we found quite interesting and therefore got us thinking about how could we bring health to church? Because since we know that these people are not actually hard to read, they're at church on Sunday. So in terms of solutions, I'm going back to Flanagan and Hancock, you know, the wheels are sort of, you know, the cogs are going around in our heads. What do we do? We've got this group of people clearly susceptible to illness, very full of faith and probably wanting to be well, but looking perhaps in, in one area that might not be, you know, the whole solution in terms of just just faith. So in terms of Flanagan and Hancock's paper, you know, they agreed that solutions um, for so-called hard to reach communities ought to be respectful, sensitive, they need to establish trust, they need to be flexible, they need to be partnership working, and they need to harness server service user involvement. And that's exactly what we decided to do. We developed a, um, a church-based intervention called the Healthy Church Initiative, and um, over about two and a half years, um, it sort of moved from a six-week program which um, we kind of said, this is how it will work. It will make it six week and we'll take people across this journey. Um, we tried it in my local church, first of all, um, and we had fantastic results in terms of um, weight loss, decrease in waist circumference. But what we found much more powerful was the feedback that people gave to us in terms of a culturally relevant solution that was scientifically sound. So people were free of, you know, myths. Um, and they loved the fact that it was Bible based, but not necessarily Bible biased. So the Healthy Church Initiative in, in itself is a six week intervention that we designed. It actually started kind of in our thoughts around 2017, um, ran it in our local church and then got a lot of feedback from people around what do you, you know, how do you think it works? Is this something that you think would work and how and why does it work for you? Um, at week one, we measure everyone so we take body measurements and um, the overall program and um, just for for the sake of time um, is based on increasing three things and decreasing three things so increase in activity increasing fluid and increasing fiber and decreasing um, sugar so we encourage churches to be sugar smart churches and that week is actually we show people how to be sugar smart we lose a lot of the sugar smart resources um, reducing um, salt and fat and controlling food portions and the kind of things that people said to us about this was that um, we want to be able 
to have a workbook, but we want to see ourselves. And that has always resonated with me quite powerfully. We want to see ourselves. So we want to see images of ourselves as black people looking healthy. Um, we want to see something with the Bible validating the fact that it's okay for us to talk about Bible scriptures that encourage us to be healthy. Um, we want to have weekly targets, we want to have prayer. So we designed these workbooks with the support of um, previous users and pe people that had been through the Healthy Church Initiative. Um, the la I mean, this just entering the third year of my PhD studies now, but in the first year, we also um, connected with 24 church leaders and I did some really in-depth qualitative interviews and said to them, what does the ideal church-based health program look like as a black church leader? And uh, again, a lot of the, you know, the um, ideas were synonymous with what previous um, service users had said, you know, we want to see ourselves, we want to see our foods, we want prayer, it's really important. But one thing that they really said, which was very interesting, that it was unanimous across these 24 leaders was, we feel that we're more of, you know, an audiovisual um, learner. So we, we don't mind having books, but can we have something audiovisual? And I'm sort of pinpointing here this QR code. So when people sign up to the Healthy Church Initiative now, they receive this book um, as a hard copy. And um, if you hover your smartphone over the QR code here, it takes people straight to a video which um, has people like them, so uh, myself and some of my team, talking about foods that they recognize um, and, you know, in a way that they will understand. It's using a lot of cultural um, connotations. And here's just an idea of some of our online resources. Um, so we are very particular about talking about our foods on the plate because often people said, you know, I don't understand this. Um, so I'm just getting a drink for my husband. <laughs> Um, I don't understand this healthy plate model. We never see our foods. I don't eat cauliflower. I don't eat um, broccoli. Where are our traditional foods? So one of the things that people wanted was to see these on a plate looking healthy. Um, so, and that's what we did. We developed online resources where people could see their foods and we calculate the calories, the protein, uh, the fiber, the salt to show people what it can look like on their plate. We also developed um, six videos, one for each week. Um, and again, you know, for, particularly for physical activity, it was very interesting. They said, we want to see black people doing the activities that we often, um, you know, are, are healthy for us, but we don't see our people doing. So we created videos, um, again, that were sort of, you know, helped to re people to resonate. So it was a bit, you know, a bit of a, you said we did kind of thing. After the six weeks, um, we collect results of churches that sign up. We present certificates of um, involvement or participation. This part is really important. We agree HCI objectives. And here is where we really encourage the church to think about having health on their agenda um, as a sustainable objective and also thinking about how as a church they now may turn that out to the black community who again is so called hard to reach so healthy church is now in their evangelical missions talking about health opening the church up to places that people can learn how to be sugar smart come in and be weighed and perhaps even just have their blood pressure taken in a place where people will understand when they might want to also pray about it. We offer further training to health champions um, who we, we help to train up in churches and we keep in contact with churches at 6, 12, 18 and 24 months. One of the really big parts of the HCI is that my team and I, we step back after this and allow the churches to become a healthy church. Obviously within our visits we give them guidance but we do encourage, I beg your pardon, um, I did warn you about the <laughs> the um, the technophobic. Yeah, there we go. Um, we do encourage them to link up with their public health team and local council. And one of the things we found is that in the black church, it's very vibrant. There's a lot going on, but we found that a lot of the time people were not linking up with local services. They weren't linking up with public health. And public health are usually doing quite a lot in terms of you know being active, of healthy cooking, and just linking churches together um, so that they can you know um, enjoy and be part of what's happening and not just be so sort of 
inward looking in terms of um, campaigns for the future, encouraging them to link in with healthy walks and other campaigns, particularly around things like hypertension and childhood obesity. Um, we decided in 2018 that we ought to move out of the church and we thought, you know, there's Black African Caribbeans in the church, but actually what about Islam? So we took a real um, courageous step um, and we recruited 20 Christian women and 20 Muslim women um, from the Woolwich Mosque in 2018. And we took them through a six week program, which was really just based around sugar. And this was some feedback from previous users. They loved the fact um, that you could use the food scanner <laughs> to measure sugar. And, and, you know, sugar was something that they were so shocked at hidden sugar. They said, you know, we'd like to go a bit deeper with sugar. So we thought that we'd contact the local mosque and thought, you know, we seem to not all this in the Christian community. What does it, would it look like if we looked at another faith group that's, um, close by and <clears throat> um, we yeah we, we got these women together went through a six week program the results were very very similar the average weight loss the reduction in waist circumference we also had um, a life coach um, an islamic life coach who joined as well to, just to support ladies um, in goal setting and what we found was very interesting was the community spirit, women supporting each other. And we, re we realized that actually they don't have to be of the same faith. Even though faith was important, we felt that culture actually trumped faith, which was very interesting. So we had you know, quite a, a volatile area of Southeast London. I think it was around the time that, you know, um, there was a lot of controversy around the killing of um, Lee Rigby and the Woolwich Moss was sort of, you know, a place that um, people felt was, you know, a dangerous place. You can't go there. We did. And it was very successful. It was very interesting that there was nothing about proselytization. It was more about culture. And one of the quotes that came from the women was, you know, working with us on the cultural side has helped to tell us how we can be healthier with our foods that we know. Again, this was very crucial to us. So. Moving forward as the Healthy Church Initiative um, for 2020, and we've tried to reach out to four churches, and this is four churches with our online model. So since COVID-19, we've really had to change the way that we've worked, and so far we've been quite successful in recruiting and signing up four churches on our online model, which means that we are not going into churches. There isn't that sort of face-to-face, hands-on interaction and a lot more training of health champions. For 2021, we're looking at reaching another 16 churches, but we also want to remove the Healthy Church Initiative and actually give it another name so that we're also reaching mosques as well. Again, aiming for Black African Caribbeans where we know that the incidence and prevalence of avoidable chronic illness is quite high. I'd like to end with hard to reach and just wanted to pose this question to you as you might be sipping on your morning drink, as I am. Imagine that you had a, a packet of your favorite biscuits, and I am a dietitian that eats biscuits, on the top shelf and you really wanted one. Would you stand on tippy toes, repeatedly struggling and repeating the words, hard to reach, hard to reach, or would you simply get a step carefully reach them, ensuring not one of them got broken. Really wanted, getting a step, carefully reaching, ensuring one's not broken. And that's the question with Heart to Reach. You've been amazing. Thank you for listening. Great. Oh, thank you so, so much, Shola. It's brilliant. Um, just so everybody knows, we will be sharing these slides afterwards, along with all the relevant links. Um, so uh, I think a few questions have come through. Um, and I think I'll pass on. I did have a question later, though, if it's possible to pass. Um, Ren, would you be happy to share some of the questions? Yeah, we didn't have that many questions come through, but I'm sure many will come as we, as we talk more. Um, uh, one kind of earlier on, just about uh, how you would um, describe what a refuser is. You talked kind of earlier on about refusers in your slides. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I um, it was actually coined by the researchers in 2010. So I just quoted that from their paper. I was quite astounded actually, but I'm imagining um, from what I've heard and obviously from my own research for my PhD is, you know, refusers are people that refuse treatment. And I, I wonder if that describes the kind of patients that I was 
um, or, or clients I was describing who, who may, you know, get a diagnosis of something and, and refuse to take the treatment or refuse to come to the clinic because they are praying about it or they have a, an alternative way that they feel their illness can be reached. I, I'm just picking and guessing, but I thought that was an unusual way of describing someone who's sort of hard to reach. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite a negative word to use. But I must say, Ren, though, I do recall um, in my dietetic um, days um, that I would see on, you know, patient cards that were passed on to me, um, patient refuses advice or refuses to follow advice. Interesting. OK, that makes sense. Wow, um, very interesting use of language, isn't it? And on that same vein, Simon had quite an interesting question about um, you, you, using this phrase hard to reach a lot. And uh, Simon posed, is it better to use uh, phrases like seldom heard or seldom reached? Or have you got uh, another way that you'd put it? Or is it even, would you even use a way to describe these hard to reach groups? I wonder, I mean, I, 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 you know, I've used the, the term hard to reach as a very tongue in cheek throughout here to really, you know, to, to sort of just show how inappropriate it is. You know, people are not hard to reach. They're in church on Sunday, they're on mosque on Friday. But people are actually, people are where they are. But, but um, I, I wonder, I, I wonder what the term should be. And um, one of the pieces that I will be doing is actually asking people in these, you know, so-called hard to reach. I think, if anything, I think people are vulnerable. And, and I think, you know, vulnerabilities capture people who are not just from BAME communities, actually. Um, but um, I, I do think hard to reach is quite a ne negative term and almost tells you that immediately that, you know, um, you're, you're a bit awkward, you know, you're a bit odd. And therefore also suggesting that it's going to take lots of money to, to, you know, to reach you. But, you know, there is data showing that the voluntary sector is really good at reaching um, these vulnerable or smaller perhaps, you know, they, they tend to be smaller um, groups or smaller communities or less common communities. I don't know, I can't think of a suitable coinage yet. Perhaps that's something that we can put out, Ray. <laughs> of the discussion. <laughs> um, and then one final question, oh, actually, might, some of them might come through actually, but there's one really interesting one about, um, from Tejal on, um, have you found that PhD messaging has had to be adapted for language? Um, have you seen that starting? And also, has there been um, an increase of foods from sustainable sources, like fruit and vegetables? So I guess, has there been, uh, as well as increasing traditional foods, has there been messaging on, on sustainable foods too? Yeah, I'll take the first one, uh, PhD messaging, most definitely. I mean, we've, we've, I think Vera mentioned at the introduction, we were really, um, I was very fortunate to, to be um, part of the PhD he campaign for sugar smart um, in Bain communities and um, some of the feedback we had to give them was you know you're, you're just going to have to change some of the way you're, <laughs> you're you know addressing things and you know it's very interesting particularly the, the videos these sort of sugar smart videos have these um, sort of multicolored individuals um, which and, and part of the brief we were given was to go into churches and play these videos and people were looking at them saying I don't understand why are they coloured red and blue? And <laughs> because it's just not, not, and therefore they felt it was unserious because it, it's not people. It looks like, um, somebody said it looked like um, Morph, uh, obviously telling your age, if you know who Morph is from Tony Hart's show. And they're saying, it looks like children's comedy, you know? And, and that was quite interesting. I think we've done a little bit of work with the Better Health campaign with mm. Public Health England. And yes, again, we've given a lot of advice on the use of language. So, so yes, I think it's something that needs to be um, blended into some of the messaging when we're trying to reach um, different communities. Brilliant, really interesting. And, and, and sorry, sustainable. Yeah. yeah, do you know something funny? I was asked this question um, about a year and a half ago, and I think it was provoked um, by uh, a sustain meeting that was dad I was at and um, I remember growing up in North London my mum my mum and dad came to the UK in the late 50s and we grew everything in the garden and you know even attempted to grow you know like African um, you know okras and things in the garden and I think as people have been moved into certain areas where houses don't have gardens I've watched this decline. You know, people would usually say, oh, I just, mum just got spinach from the garden. We've got callaloo from the garden. Um, you know, mum's growing them. I've, I've seen that decline. 
and when people are, you know, reporting diet histories. And one of the things we encourage or trying to encourage people to do now is even if you don't have a garden, and particularly churches, why don't you find out who has a garden and have some communal growth of things that we know we eat a lot of. So spices, seasoning is so important to our food. So things like thyme, sage, somebody can grow those that, you know, if a church member has a big garden or if um, then they can bring them into church and share them. So we have church members who have like um, pear trees in their gardens. Um, some people are going carrots, some of them are going um, peppers. And we get people, encourage people, actually, you know, we want you to eat more vegetables and some of it you can grow yourself. But I think it's proven difficult because of the living condition of some people now. Gardens are just not something they always have unless they live in a community where they can share and grow interesting there's that kind of loss of direct connection with the food being grown and that's that's true for many urban environments isn't it um there are a couple of questions as well i'm not sure vera what about timing should do you think we need to start uh, yeah uh, we are a little bit short on time i was going to suggest something um because there are some really really good questions how's about it because it, it felt so uh, such an opportunity to have breakout groups for people to reflect because we're obviously such a big group um, so we are happy to extend the session past 11 uh, to kind of continue some of that discussion. So if that's okay, we are noting the questions. So if we don't get to them, perhaps Shirley, if you're happy, you can um, answer them and we can share them via email. Um, but if that's okay, we're almost at 1040. They're 20 minute breakout sessions. So I think at this point we'll be coming back right at 11. So my apologies to anybody who has to leave right at 11. But again, um, the whole session's recorded. Uh, except for the breakout groups. So you won't miss anything if you watch the recording. Is that okay, guys? We, um, we can go to the breakout groups and we'll have discussions and questions there. And um, by the way, just for the note takers, I'm gonna uh, include the questions again. Um, uh, that they're suggested questions for discussion. So if your discussion goes in a different direction, that's totally okay. But that is in the uh, chat now, the, the kind of the two broad questions that people can reflect on. Thank you. So uh, I know a few people have gone, but uh, we felt that it would just be great to not rush today's session and to give a bit more space. So um, yeah, so just the space would be great for um, if anybody else wants to reflect or any other questions, obviously, because <laughs> uh, we know we didn't have enough time to get to everything. So um, I don't remember how to do the raised hand thing or what the best system is, but if you'd like to speak, just um, you can just unmute yourself and we can keep an eye out. Um, or you can kind of put a message into the chat as well, actually. So over to you guys, if anybody has a question or a reflection or any thoughts on what they might do differently or uh, you know, take forward. Hi, Vera. Um, we actually had a question from our group from the lovely Sheena Fashola, if, if you're still keen to ask that question. Yeah, definitely. So um, I was just asking about participatory action research and whether as a research student yourself, whether you'd had um, done this before or whether you were thinking about conducting this in the future, especially for other ethnicities to have more control about their healthy lives? Yeah, 100%. We're actually looking at, um, we, we'd like to create a model for um, mosques next. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're looking at doing a qualitative piece and focus groups actually um, and I'm probably going to do that while I'm alongside my PhD because it should be something that's quite quick. Um, so yes, we desperately are because we want to make sure that there's sort of a co-production um, in, in getting something that's suitable for the mosque. Okay, that's great to hear. Thanks. I, I have a quick question. I think, um, Ren, I think it came up in the chat, um, which I thought would be really interesting. Um, this is, I guess, a show that's for yourself, or really um, also anybody else if they have anything to share about whether this work um, takes into account um, the food environment and focuses on that. Um, so is there an outward focus as well as an inward focus into kind of, you know, family and home uh, choices and behaviors? I'll definitely, um, from my point of view, Vera, I think it's something, every time I speak to you or Ren or receive your communications, it reminds me just how much more we need to do as the HCI. I think we're a tiny little speck in this massive 
um, massive pl platform looking for solutions, but it reminds me how much we need to do and be a lot more outward thinking, which makes me think collaboration and, you know, we're writing our objectives for um, 2021 and really looking at how we can be a lot more outward reaching in terms of that. So that's something that I think we, we, we're not even close to what we can be, but there's great opportunity. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. In our group, we had a question from um, if Fariha is still with us. Um, maybe you wanted to ask a question, but if you're not still with us, I can around um, online outreach. If you're not still with us, that's fine. I can ask it. Um, yeah, I think that the question um, in, yeah, in oh, Fariha, yeah, she's just trying to talk. Yes. Go, go ahead. I'm finding it really hard to. To unmute myself and mute myself back again. But yeah, my question is, I run a Facebook group and a Facebook page for South Asians. Um, and it covers not just UK, but people from all around the world can join the group. And my Facebook group has got half a million followership. And, uh, my, and the page has got over 100,000. Um, my, my question is because I work on healthy eating awareness. I make videos in Urdu. Uh, focusing on basics like what is carbs, proteins, and how to follow a healthy lifestyle. And when Shola talked about the culturally relevant solution for plates, I make up plates of South Asian foods and show pictures to them, make videos. So my videos are also available on YouTube. So my question is, I'm really, I'm really loving the idea of the six week intervention which Shola has been doing in the churches. My question is that having a followership of half a million people, how can I reach, how can I start the six week intervention with such a big group or if I can just pick people out, but is there a way, is there a support where I can um, online do something like this? The online reach basically, is it possible? I think one of my weaknesses is definitely IT, I won't lie, but um, I'll say a resounding yes, it's possible. I think one caveat for me has been across um, countries is that because the guidance is different, we've, it, we've struggled a little bit to put somebody from who's from Nigeria in Nigeria with a, a Nigerian in the UK because the cooking methods, they're so different. Um, that sometimes it, it just doesn't match up. So we, we've, we've had to separate them, um, you know, by nations. But I think I would say yes, and I'd be happy to talk to you offline on some of the very simplistic things we've done, because I think some of them are quick, are quick wins, and I just admire what you're doing. Because I really believe it, it, it is, it's really working. The videos, I make regular posts, and almost every, every day there is a post where they say that it has changed their life. They have started. They, they have started moving more, or they have reduced their sugar, or whatever. But uh, but I just feel that it is very difficult to gauge the results. You know, I know it's making a change, but I cannot present it or prove. There is no proof because there's so many half a million people, and it's online, just posts, messages. So it's really difficult to gauge that, which which is something I want to do. I think you've got to, to start small, Vera. I think that's it's so important to start small and get some really robust data. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, people have been asking if, um, if it will be possible to have Shola your contact details or the contact details for Food for Purpose. So we will definitely share that afterwards as well. So we <laughs> hope you're ready to <laughs> tackle that inbox. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, yes, we're kind of, we're nearing 1110. Um, if, yeah, if there's any more questions, again, we don't want to rush you guys, but, other, you know, otherwise we'll, we'll be soon kind of uh, bringing the session to the close. Uh, but yeah, but feel free. Um, there's some stuff coming through in the chat. Um, okay. Um, uh, Shajna, is it okay to, um, do you want to ask the question or um, uh, unmute yourself if so? Go for it. Hi. Can you, can you see me? Yes. Sorry, my, my internet connection is absolutely rubbish. So that's why I've just kind of kind of kept it to a minimum. It was just, um, I, I, so I'm Shazna and I'm from Oldham and um, I work predominantly around holiday hunger. 
Um, so recently we've set up like a steering group um, for Oldham's food security. So it's looking at food poverty, how to kind of um, work around food. So I wanted to kind of bring up a discussion about making food banks and um, food parcels, food hubs in the community more culturally appropriate. So people from all backgrounds and all cultures can access. Um, but because it's kind of like a, I wanna, I wanna start the conversation. It's almost like I'm, I'm kind of thinking, what questions do I ask? How do I approach this? It's, it's just right from kind of from the bottom up really. So I'd, I'd like to know if you've got any tips of how I can start and where I can start and what questions I can ask even. Does, that, is, does it make sense? Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I've been posed with this several times and I've always recommended that people um, ask the people that they're serving, find out what, what people actually would like to see. Um, I think one thing I know that people have struggled with is asking people because I think uh, certainly in the Black African Caribbean community there's a bit of um, still a little bit of shame um, that you know you can't afford to feed yourself and therefore people feel a bit um, embarrassed about making a request but um, I think it's about you know saying we want you to be well nourished and to make sure that we're reaching you with foods that you actually are going to eat because people were throwing away um, foods because they didn't actually eat them so I think there's something about putting people or, or having representatives from the people that your community that you're serving and asking them um, you know the, what they think would work best what do you think would work well what would you like to see okay thank you that's brilliant I think um Bea, yeah, I can't know if Vera is still there, but I think um, maybe we should. Vera, are you okay? Yeah, sorry, someone at the door, as you do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so um, I guess, uh, yeah, let's wrap it up to a close. Um, we have been recording this, so we'll be sharing it. Um, thank you so much, Shola, for everything, uh, for all of your contributions. And thank you, everybody else, for all of your brilliant questions and reflections. Uh, we will be pulling this together and sharing it with you guys. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for attending. Just a quick quick plug to join the Sugar Smart mailing list if you're not already Yes, yet. oh yes, of course, we shared it earlier. Good call. So um, yeah, uh, there is, we can share the link in the chat box now if you wanna grab it before we close. Uh, but yeah, no, those uh, definitely, please do join our growing network um, it'd be brilliant to have your expertise and also to be able to share free resources with you uh, and your colleagues locally. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shayla. Thank Bye-bye.